Welcome everyone to Slow Art Friday. My name is Paige Taylor, the Learning and Engagement Assistant here at the Asheville Art Museum. And I'm happy to be joined today by Hank Bovey, our touring docent. As you participate today, remember to choose a quiet room and close the door and silence alerts from devices. Try not to sit in front of a bright light source, use headphones and microphones for best sound quality, and use a desktop, laptop, or tablet for the best viewing experience. Make sure your screen name includes your first and last name, or first name and last initial. To ask questions or make comments today, you can unmute your microphones, um, type into the chat box, or raise your hand. And we are recording, so if you prefer not to be part of the recording, you're welcome to turn off your video and mute your microphone, and you can participate through the chat box. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Hank will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our special exhibitions. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork. Hank will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own slowly before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Hank, myself, and each other. Hank, what are we gonna be talking about today? And you can unmute yourself when you're ready, Hank. So good afternoon, everybody. As, as Faze mentioned, I'm Hank Moby, and I think everybody here has uh, been to a slower Friday with me before. And today, as Laurel pointed out in the chat, after she heard the Johnny Cash song, I Walk the Line, we're going to be looking at images that I selected because I think line is an important element of the three images that we're going to look at today. In other words, where the artist has taken line to really um, add to the meaning, the, the narrative, whatever, of the images we're looking at. So with that said, as we look at these, I will give you a few moments to look at each artwork, and then we'll ask you some questions. There are no wrong answers, so feel free to jump in. Um, you can either just speak up, raise your hand, um, type in the chat box, whatever works best for you, and, um, and we'll go from there. So Paige, if you would, let's go ahead and look at the first image. So take a few moments to look at it, and then we will talk about it. All right, what do you think is going on in this artwork? Well, I don't know a lot about trees or foliage, so I don't know what kind of trees these are, but what I find interesting is the way they're all kind of leaning towards the center. So exactly, and they are all leaning towards the center. And these are palm trees, I think primarily. So, um, so good observation there. And what else can we see here? Well, some of them don't have any live growth on them at all. Right? So it, exactly, if we look at these trees, um, we can see where some of them still have plenty of fronds, where others don't look so good. Um, they have no foliage, and I think that's a good use of lime because they are so stark, because in this image, there's pretty much nothing but lime. Um, it's very monochromatic, well, it's black and white, but it's just the black lines against the gray sky. So the lines are very prominent. Um, so let's think, think about what um, Laurel just pointed out, that some of the trees have no foliage on them. What are some things you, that might cause that? Some kind of decay or animal infestation, some kind of like bugs that they could have bugs, decay, any other thoughts on that? Uh, Joanne is saying that the, regarding the verticality of the um, lines of the, of the trees, it leads her eyes up to the top of the composition. Maybe the trees aren't very healthy because of the environment or erosion. So, so that is a, a, an excellent observation in that, you know, 
if you think about plants, house plants you might have, you know, when you kill them, which we all do, um, <laughs> it's because we have provided conditions that are not optimal for that particular plant. We either give them too much water, not enough water, the wrong soil, um, we poisoned them somehow. So that's, that's kind of what's going on here. Um, it, what else can we see? Maybe it's the angle of the way the photo is taken, why some are so much taller than the others. Like the one on the left in the foreground is almost at the top of the composition where the ones on the bottom are shorter. And I don't know if that's just the way the picture's taken or if some of them really are taller. And, and I suspect it's a bit of both. I think the, the photographer probably was pretty much pointing his camera up at an angle. So he captured those, especially that tree on the left and the right, that kind of frame the top of the photograph. And, and then as you go backwards, they're not only smaller, but just farther away. So it's a, a little bit of both the perspective and the um, angle of the shot. So when we think about line, um, one of the things line does besides um, define, say, shape, it also creates patterns and it also can help with a sense of movement or stillness. Um, with that in mind, uh, do you have any comments on, on how this photo might relate to those two concepts? There is one interesting, go ahead. I was gonna say there's an interesting branch that is kind of straight up that has um, two little branches going off it with no fronds on it. Yes, that's like almost like um, misplaced. Like it almost doesn't fit in with everything else that's going on. I, I, I see what you're saying. Yes, exactly that. that. And it's thinner than the other trees as well, but it, it doesn't fit. So it's a little bit different use of line. That if we think about line, um, one of the things that that line tends to make us look at in, in images is, I mean, you know, there's going to be horizontal lines, vertical lines, and then diagonal lines. Um, diagonal lines typically are associated with movement. When we see a diagonal line in, in an artwork, that gives us a sense of of movement, or it makes the image more dynamic. Um, these lines tend to be more straight up and down. So to me, that makes this image look very still. There's nothing going on. There's just stillness, um, you know, and, and a lack of activity, which in my mind is kind of associated with, with death, you know, or, or um, and that kind of thing. So anything else that we can see? I was just going to comment about it being black and white, since you were commenting on sort of stillness and associations with like lack of activity or death. So sometimes, sometimes black and white can kind of feel a little bit more somber than color, or just have a different feeling. And that's a good observation, because yeah, you're right, color can also um, enhance the mood of the artwork. So this lack of color, I think, kind of leads to that, that despair that the trees are feeling because it's just cold and black and white. Because some of them are leaning so much, it almost looks like they might want to fall. Like I could almost envision motion of this from coming out of the stillness, like timber, like they're going to come down. <laughs> Well, and very good observation that kind of, I was just thinking that the question might be, if this was your backyard, would you be worried? Yeah, yes. Definitely, because something's going on here. Um, so any, any last comments or questions on this one? I know you said they're palm trees, but they almost look like those weeds where you just kind of want to like make a wish and blow on them. And <laughs> that's what the tops look like to me. I, I actually, I like that because, um, you know, um, since we sort of suspect these trees aren't healthy 
um, and, and earlier there was a mention of environmental impact might be part of the problem here. So maybe there is sort of a wishfulness here that we wish it could be better. We wish mankind had treated um, the earth better and so on. So, so good, good observation. Anybody else? Hey, let's go ahead and move to the title slide. So, and this is Skip's Canopy from the Un an Unflinching Look series by Benjamin Dimmitt. And this was taken in 2015. Um, and what this is, is this is actually, it was taken in Florida. The artist is actually from Florida. And it's exactly what we said, these trees are dying because of their, um, what man has done to their environment. And what's happened is these are grown in like freshwater swampy areas, but because of the encroachment of man, the water is becoming um, contaminated with salt water due to numerous issues. One is just the, the constant construction that Florida's gone through. Another one is um, the underground aquifer in Florida has been, um, as the artist put it, mismanaged. And so that's allowed salt water to flow into these freshwater areas. And that's what's killing these trees. And the Unflinching Look series is a whole series of photographs of um, the natural world in Florida and, and the problems that, that mankind and the explosive growth of Florida um, have, have caused. So um, just some information, um, the artist Benjamin Dimmitt photographs wetlands, forests, and the landscape using film and a medium format camera. He uses this camera to investigate interdependence, competition, survival, and mortality in the natural environment. And we definitely see that, that mortality um, element here. He was born and raised on the Gulf, Gulf Coast of Florida, graduated from Eckert College in St. Petersburg, and also studied at the International Center of Photography in New York City, um, New York, also at the Santa Fe Photographic Workshop in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He moved to New York City after college, was an adjunct professor there at the International Center of Photography until 2013. He now lives and works in the Asheville area. I think he's in Swannanoa, I read. So he's now a local photographer. So any last comments or thoughts before we move on? All right, Paige, if you would go to the next one. Take a few moments to look at this and then we will talk about it. So what do you all think is going on in this photograph? Well, this is a track runner, and this is very dramatic. I mean, up in the air, and the strength, and the colors, and, and, and even the lines in the back where it would be lighting and some sort of, a, yes, a stadium there. And um, I'm drawn to the lines every which way. I mean, his arm is one way, the arm the other way, both legs. It, it's just very, um, it's, it's amazing. It's really amazing. It is a wonderful photograph, isn't it? And um, and as you said, it's and if you compare that to the last photograph, we talked about how the last photograph was very still, very. Um, we talked about death; the trees were dying. This is pretty much just the opposite. There's, you know, obvious movement. It's very alive. And the colors are bright. So all good observations. Anything else we can see? So if we kind of look at some of the elements that Laurel mentioned, um, the way his arms are, are moving, his or position, his leg, the light, um, what can we say about some of those elements? Well, the lighting is very interesting because you see the sneaker in the foreground, all bright white. And then his one shoulder has, has light there. So that, that's very, that is very interesting. And, um, you can see the, the strength too in his arms and legs, as well as, um, you know, and the arms, yeah, just. Well, exactly, the light, I think to your point, the, 
the shoes being so lit, the light, the shoes are kind of the sort of the, I'll say the source of his power. He's running, he's a runner. So those shoes are lit, but also the way the light, um, especially on that left arm, um, if this were bigger, you could really see his muscles more clearly, but it really highlights the muscles. Um, Joanne says, oh, sorry, Nick. Joanne says in the in the chat, I love the way the line starts at the left with his leg and draws her eye to the figure. Dynamic, strong, movement, powerful. Exactly. The, the line just goes right up that leg, um, up into the athlete's torso. Um, and also, as we mentioned, um, uh, I mentioned on the first image we looked at that Light or line the lines that are diagonal tend to indicate motion, and we see a lot of diagonal lines here. Um, you know, if we follow that line that was just mentioned in the chat up his leg and up his body, it's pretty much a 45 degree angle almost, and that's what gives him that motion. Um, and then his, his right arm is a diagonal going backwards, that gives that an, another area of motion. And um, so it's and then Joanne says, I love the way Lodge starts his leg, yes. So, any other observations? So, one of the things that caught my eye on this photograph was the light in the sky. Yeah. And if you look at, especially, especially the light that's right above his head and his arm, the way the streaks come out, again, in diagonals, to me, that light kind of reminds me of, um, say, an old religious artworks, you know, um, holy figures or sacred figures tend to have that sort of same kind of lighting. So it's almost like they're portraying him, and I don't want to say as a god, but as, as you know, um, something elevated above the, the rest of us mere mortals. And the camera angle from so low underneath him. Right, that low camera angle exactly kind of gives him, kind of gives us the sense that he's flying. What else can we see? The way his knee is like, um bent like that, that the knee is at the fore, almost like it's pushing him like through the air, right? Yeah. It, exactly, you can see the, the power, um, you know, how powerful he is an athlete with that knee. And also I kind of like the way that that thigh on that same leg and the arm mimic each other as right. far as, as the pattern. And then also his left arm almost where it's coming up, the forearm um, mimics the light poles on the in the background on the top of the stadium. Anything else? The colors are dark, but yet you can see the little bit of the red coming out like on the bottom of his shorts and yes, and at the top of his uh, jersey there, a little bit of the red and, and whatever the logo in the center, like orangey yellow and uh, just it's a dark photo, but yet it's very bright. I like the way you put that. It is. It's, there's a lot of light, but it, it, the overall impression is it's dark. And um, one Josh. thing that you, you brought up that I that I noticed when I look at this, so he's wearing red red shorts and a blue shirt, and he's flying through the air. Who else does that? Who else wears red <laughs> shorts and a blue shirt and flies through the air? Superman. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I kind of think that's deliberate. <laughs> and Joanne comments that um, she likes that his face is lit. This, this is light up here. Uh, Joanne commented that uh, she likes how his face is lit, like this light that's highlighting him here, I think, on his face and arm. Yep, I think lighting his face kind of helps us remember that he is human. And because we see a human face rather than just this figure flying through the air. Superman, is, as Laurel said. So, anything else we can say about this photograph?
Well, let's go ahead there, the page, and move to the title slide. And this is Carl Lewis, so an athlete that we're all very familiar with. The photographer, Walter Yost, um, is actually one of the greatest sports photographers out there. He has photographed for Sports Illustrated for um, over 58 years and over 100, photo, 100 covers um, he's photographed. So he's considered one of the great sports photographers. He's not trained as an artist. He was given a camera, I think, at age 15. And back in his home state of Texas, he started photographing local sports teams. And his photographs were impressive enough that he just got bigger and bigger jobs and ended up at um, Sports Illustrated. And one thing that we talked about in the when we were talking about this is the lighting. We had several comments about the lights, the lights in the background, the lights on his body, and how dramatic they were. And he has been actually dubbed the, Ram, the Rembrandt of sports photography. And if you look at how he's lit this figure, and if you think back on Rembrandt's paintings, now he lights his subjects, you can see that's a pretty valid uh, comparison. And I have a quote for you from him. And he said, athletes are used to coaches. He says, I learned there's a certain way to speak to an athlete and you start to get the connection. So he connects with all of the athletes before he photographs them. These aren't just random candid photographs as he's walking by. He meets the athletes, he gets to know them, he talks to them, and I think he's able to capture their personality because of that. And, and one last thing I'll mention is this is part of an exhibit at the museum that is well worth seeing. There are several photographs by Walter Yost. There's um, exhibits right now at the museum that are all centered around the Olympics, um, since that's a very current topic. So not only Olympic athletes, but there's also an exhibit around um, the medals. And by medals, I mean silver, gold, bronze. So there's an exhibit around those three um, medals. So well worth seeing if you get a chance to go down to the museum. Any last comments or questions on this one? Paige, let's go to the next one. So what do you think is going on in this photograph? I really like this. I, I don't know where the animals are going. It almost reminds me of Noah's Ark, so to speak. I, it looks like three giraffes, but they all look like they're two by two, all different kinds of sizes and types of animals. And uh, the lines of what look like staircases and windows and even the top lighted domes and the top of the ceiling um, just, yeah, it's all very intriguing. So, uh, and after Tuesday, I think your Noah's Ark uh, <laughs> comment is very appropriate. <laughs> so, but it does, and that's, I, I, I showed this to another group recently, and they had the same exact response, it's Noah's Ark. And, and I do like the way that the lines create that background um, that give us, um, not necessarily a sense of a ship, but a sense of a big structure, which the ark would be. So anything else we can see here? Can we zoom in, like if you went by the one giraffe and then went above his head to like the second stair area from the top, one higher, a little higher, go up. Yeah, are those animals there or birds on the left? Like, yes, a little higher and up a little more. Yeah, to in that area there. It almost looks like, yes, like there's some hanging animals or uh, hard to say what's there, but that's interesting. And there, there could be, there could be. So, um, so let's say, while you've got it magnified, Paige, if you would go down to the, back down towards the bottom where the, where the animals are, are um, moving across the bottom of the image. Yeah. So if we think about that, do we think these animals are actually walking across some kind of platform? I see movement. I mean, looking at the legs of the animals. Yes. So, 
because if we if we go down that that path, a couple of things I want to mention is one, if we look at the variety of animals, um, how likely is it that this diverse group of animals would all be cool, calm, and collected walking together? Um, possibly not likely, but also, and you can't really see that in this image, but some of the animals, you can see their feet are actually on, on like platform type um, pieces of wood. So they're... Okay. So this may have been put together like a collage almost because, I mean, some of these animals might have the other animals for dinner. I mean, this... <laughs> But exactly, that was the point that I was making. Is is um, as much as it looks like they're all happy, happily walking along, it, it's probably unlikely because yeah, there's predators and prey walking together here. And but if we look at the image, if you want to back out a little bit again, Paige. Um, so let's say they aren't really walking; they're stationary. But what in this image gives us that that feeling of movement? Hmm. Well, as you had mentioned in the previous picture, Hank, I think the diagonal lines um, give us that sense. We see the diagonals from the, the staircases and whatever these maybe display cases are down here. And even just the, this path that the animals are traveling on is a kind of a diagonal down into the corner. It, and that's... I think exactly right. I think it's a very valid observation. If the staircases, the, the edge of that platform or stage or whatever they're on, even the giraffe's necks are at a yeah, diagonal. Yeah. Um, and Joanne agrees. She says the curved platform gives it movement for her. Right. If this was all straight, so to speak, if, if the staircases weren't there, if we were looking at the platform or stage, and it was level, it was a horizontal line in front of us, we probably wouldn't have even think about motion in this photograph. We would say, hey, these, are, these animals are just parked there. I think they would almost look like statues. You know, if that was even just a blank background back there and um, just a straight plank, they, they would almost look like wooden statues. Well, and with that said, since you think they look like statues, where do you think this might be? What kind of um, place is this? Wow. So um, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a trick question because it could be anywhere indoors, um, but it, other than the circus or a zoo, you know, the, the next likely place you're gonna see animals indoors, especially stationary animals is in a museum. So this is actually a museum of natural history. Wow. Um, and then so these animals are all stuffed for lack of a better word. And they're not alive. And so they're not moving. And they're just stuffed. I don't think they're on a stage. I don't really know exactly. I know where which museum this is and we'll get to that. But I don't know where these may are. I suspect they're somewhere behind the scenes. I don't think this is a public area. Um, it's a staging area or a storage area or something like that. Okay. And any other comments? Please let's move to the title slide then. So I will let you all read the title for yourselves because my French pronunciation would, uh, it's pretty bad. But the, the Grand Gallery is, is the, this is the uh, Museum of Natural History in Paris. So, so that's where they are. The photographer is Matthew Pillsbury. He was born in France in 1973, but he is an American. And he got his BA in 1995 from Yale, his MFA from the School of Visual Arts. He specializes in long exposure photographs made only with available light. And Laura, you pointed out the use of light earlier, especially the light coming in from those upper windows. And he focuses on the passage of time and people within spaces, public and private. So instead of people, we've got animals here and it is a private space, I, I believe. And 
his work addresses the growing role of technology in playing in our lives and the sense of modern seclusion that could seem at odds with the constant connectivity being offered by our smartphones and tablets. And then I think that's apparent here in that, you know, this is not something you would find on your smartphone. So he's comparing that to, to what we look at every day. So Why are there two dates? Why does it say 2008, 2013? 2008 was when the image was taken and 2015 is when it was printed for 13, 15, yeah. So that's when you see the two dates on a photograph. The first date is the, the date the actual photograph was made and then the second date is when it was printed because you know with the negative he could print photographs as long as he wants to. So that's that's the two dates. A good question. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty big. Thirty nine by thirty one. That's that's pretty big. Yep. It's a nice big photograph, and it, uh, as you mentioned, you liked it a lot. I do too. It's a very nice one. And again, this is another good exhibit that's currently going on at the museum called In the Public Domain. And as its name implies, it's photographs that are. Um, in the public domain, so not private spaces necessarily where, where, where we can't go. So, anything else we can say about this? Well, folks, that's our images for today. I want to thank you all so much for calling in. Thanks for all the, the good comments and commentary. As always, you see things um, that I never see in photographs. So that's one of the things I like the best about Slow Art Friday. So with that said, I think our next one page is in two weeks, right? Um, actually, we've got one, uh, the next one scheduled for next week, Friday, August 27th. And our docent, Megan Pyle, uh, has chosen um, artworks with the theme of women's bodies in a museum. So uh, we hope that you'll uh, join us next week for that. And um, and Hank, thank you so much for the selection of artworks that you showed us today. And, and thank you all for participating in our wonderful discussion. <laughs> all right, have a great week. Hope to see you again. Bye-bye.